Welcome, good afternoon. You're watching us here on Halftime Report. I'm Mangla Malu. With me, so Sonia Shinoi, as well as Ekta Batra. Not looking as bad as it was, uh, you know, an hour ago for the markets. The Nifty is down 100 points. Yes, the Sensex down about 400 points as well. But the recovery uh, from the lows has been pronounced. And at the same time, the Nifty Bank, which was down at 200, 250 odd points at one point in time, is now down just about 65 odd points. And the mid-cap index is doing much better. Almost a percent gains on that index. More stocks advancing than declining. And uh, while we will talk about individual stocks, just keep in mind, uh, we got numbers from Varun Beverages moments ago. A strong 27% jump in their revenue comes off a low base. And we've seen the profits of the company as well jump all the way up from, uh, you know, 16, 17 odd crores to about 64 crores. And as a result of which, that stock surging away up 6, 6.5% as we speak. So good going for individual pockets. Uh, but some weakness in the front line end. Oh, absolutely. Some weakness. And a lot of the Adani Group stocks are also off from their lows, yeah. right? So that is a good thing that at least the kind of volatility that we saw last week in Adani Group stocks, there is a little bit of settling of that. Some of them are, in fact, in the green. Ambuja Cements is in the green. Adani Enterprises as well. Yes, there's a lot of to and fro in terms of, uh, you know, data points. But for now, Adani Ports is up about 4.5%. For now, some semblance of sanity is what we're seeing in terms of the Adani Group stocks. A lot of big numbers coming through this week. The starter steel today. Through the course of the week, you have the likes of m and and a couple of others as well. Uh, so we'll track all of that very closely. But for now, we have uh, some uh, managements joining us. Yes, uh, Sonia Manglam. Well, it's turning out to be a session where we are seeing some amount of resilience for the broader markets. And courtesy, that is a lot of stocks which are reacting positively to their numbers and have shown a good showing. Uh, case in point would be something like a Paytm as well as Interglobe Aviation. And the other stock that we're tracking this morning is, in fact, pharmacy major MedPlus, which has posted what was a good set of numbers. Revenue is up around 27%. However, the profit is lower due to a high base. This is on a year-on-year -year basis. Mr. Reddy, who's the MD and CEO of MedPlus Health Services, joins in on the show to discuss business with us. Mr. Reddy, hi. Thank you very much for joining in. Well, it has been a strong showing, but I just wanted to understand how much of this was on a like-to-like -like basis. The reason I ask is that you all have been quite aggressive on your store addition. So how much of this was actually because of organic growth and how much of this over 25% growth was because of new stores being added in the past six to eight months? See, I don't have the exact breakup for you right now. But um, I can tell you this, that our old stores continue to perform. You know, we continue to increase our gross margin. We also continue to increase our private label. So they continue to be profitable. Uh, we will come out of the full numbers, you know, shortly and all uh, on the analyst call. But um, the part of the growth is definitely due to the new stores which we are coming in. But our old stores continue to do well. Okay. Uh, Mr. Reddy, you know, and just one more follow-up with regards to the pharmacy business. The big question is how much were you discounting this quarter? Because you all have said that your average discounts have been at on a consolidated basis at around 16 and a half odd percent. This is despite omni-channel uh, delivery and expansion of pin codes. But this is versus the online players, which are at around 20, 25 percent, say for the first three transactions, and then they sort of get, you know, hooked to that particular online uh, pharmacy. So what were discounts this quarter? How is it uh, panning out vis-a-vis -vis the industry? Uh, so on the omni-channel side, I'm not sure if there's anyone else other than Apollo out there. I'm not sure what their numbers are. But uh, for us, we have been pretty steady at the 16.5% kind of discount. And that is because, you know, we have a hurdle-based discount. All bills above 1,000 have a 20% discount. And that is the larger part of our business. And bills below 1,000 have a 10% discount. So the blended discount uh, with everything included, all the FMCG, which has a slightly lower discount, which is at 5%, comes to around 16 and a half, which has been pretty steady for us. Okay. Uh, Mr. Eddie, good afternoon. I remember when we spoke in the month of December, you had said that overall you're expecting a 20% growth in your revenues for this year. And that's a trajectory you'd like to maintain next year as well. Would you change that uh, stance at all? Um... I would say more mid-20s rather okay. than just the lower 20, mm -hmm. but that's about it. I don't think it will change much because we expect to grow our stores at the same level and we also expect the overall growth in the company to be roughly around the same. I wanted to understand your uh, thoughts on a couple of things, uh, Mr. Reddy. You know, the first one was in uh, the diagnostic business, uh, uh, the competition that there is, because we do have a lot of players uh, eyeing for the same clutch of customers, so to say. 
So what are your thoughts on how the margins are likely to pan out for the industry going forward? And secondly, is on your expansion itself. Most of your expansion, as we see, has come in tier two, tier three cities. Um, are those, uh, you know, centers a lot less profit making or, uh, you know, does it take longer to break even there? What are the uni unit economics of opening stores in tier one versus tier two? Okay. All right. Let me take your second question first. The tier two, actually, as far as profitability and break even is concerned, is more favorable. The top line is slightly lesser uh, by around 10% or so. But the overall EBITDA and overall, you know, path to profitability is actually faster. So we don't suffer uh, when we actually do more of those anyway. Uh, we also do tier two mainly because of one thing, you know, we once you already have a setup, once you already have the supply chain set up in a state, mm -hmm. then it pays mm -hmm. to actually maximize the benefit out of it by putting in as many stores as possible into that particular territory or state. Hence the, you know, push into the uh, tier two sites. Again, we also feel that tier two is, uh, is again place where uh, the value proposition which we have resonates equally well, in fact, e even more so. You know, one of the main reasons why we even set up the company was to make sure that everyone has access to genuine medicines. There's a lot of fake medicines across the board. And if you look at the tier two, tier three, there is more prevalence of fake medicine. So the value proposition which we have, you know, making people, you know, have access to genuine medicines at the same time, giving them at a price which no one else can beat, resonates very well in the tier two and tier three areas. So that's the logic for that. Or to the first question, you know, is there more, is there a lot of competition? I don't believe there is competition in the area in which we are playing. We are an integrated center, which has got radiology, pathology, biochemistry, and the entire works. We are not a center which just goes home and collects samples and brings it and does the lab, just the biochemistry lab. That part, you're right. You know, there's a bunch of new entrants. There's a bunch of, you know, e-commerce guys. There's a lot of other people who are there, but that's not where we are. In our area, we believe there's only a couple of major competitors. Uh, one is, of course, the local player with their diagnostic, which is, you know, fairly well entrenched in AP Telangana and all. And then there's a couple of other guys here and there, but there's no one who is pan India and there's no one who has significant scale. Just a quick last question, Mr. Reddy, for your diagnostic business, it's on a pilot scale, uh, a pilot project basis right now. It includes pathology as well as radiology, which is basically MRI or CT scans, etc. Just tell us what the footfalls are this quarter as compared to the last quarter and what are you expecting, say, in the next two quarters? So we opened one more larger center this quarter. We had two earlier and we opened the third one. All of them, uh, the first two are, have been breaking even for a while. The third one is also ramping up very well. Um, see, our thing, if you remember, is a subscription-based model. And um, till the end of last quarter, I think we have had in excess of 60,000 memberships overall. Uh, so the membership model continues. People get, you know, uh, let us say, uh, uh, buy into the overall company's offerings through a membership. And once they are there, they become very sticky. Um, so we are seeing uh, that part of the thing play out for us. We have a deep discount, which is 75% discount, but that is only available to members. And almost everyone who basically takes our services becomes a member. And once they become a member, then they continue to avail of our services. So for us, then the marketing cost, the doctor referral cost, and all the other costs are almost non-existent. Um, so an answer to, the answer to your question, is it tracking to our expectation? Absolutely. They are breaking even. The goal is to actually put in 12 centers in entire AP uh, in Hyderabad alone uh, for the first phase of the overall thing, the pilot project. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. We will leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in and uh, you know speaking to CNBC TV 18. Let's slip into a quick break on that note. On the other side, we'll bring you our exclusive discussion with Aswad Damodaran of NYU Stern School of Business. He has a view on the valuation concerns with respect to the Adani Group. Stay tuned. Halftime report. Well, one of the key charges made in the Hindenburg report about the Adani Group is that the stocks are seriously overvalued as of January 24th. Lata caught up with a stock valuation expert, Professor Aswad Damodaran of NYU Stern, to discuss in detail about the Adani Group valuation picture. You want to listen to this one. She began by asking him about his recent blog where he values Adani Enterprises at 945 rupees and his assumptions on the Adani Group. Listen in. What I see in the Adani, I mean, forget about all the Hindenburg group, all the stuff in that report. But what I see in this business 
is a company that invests in infrastructure investments, which have long gestation periods, require huge capital expenditures up front, and are not that profitable. It's the nature of the business. So when I approached the valuation of Adani Enterprises, that's what I brought to the game. I had to bring in the fact that this is not a business that can generate 30% margins or 40% margins. You're going to be lucky to get to 6 or 7% margins. The global average for infrastructure companies is about 48 to 5%. So at 7%, I'm already pushing the limit on what those margins will be. And even if you assume that they can continue to grow at the storage pace that they've maintained for the last couple of years, you know, there are only so many airports you can build, so many ports you can construct, so many infrastructure investments you can make. So I thought I tried, I mean, I tried my best to bend over backwards to make optimistic assumptions, but I had a tough time getting past 1,000 rupees, 1,200 rupees per share. So that was, you know, and that was where they were trading before the last 18 months. I don't know what the ratchet was that caused the price to jump as much as it did. But to me, at the, you know, the 3,800 rupees was trading at, at the start of the year, I just can't get there with the kinds of businesses they're running. Okay, uh, so you have assumed 7% margins and 24.5%, uh, 25% uh, revenue growth because that was the growth between 2002 and 2015, you point out. I actually give them 30% revenue growth for the next five years. I actually assumed that they'd be even, I mean, part of it is from existing reinvestments starting to pay off and infrastructure investments take a while to pay off. So I actually gave them 30% revenue growth for the next five years and pushed the margins over time to 7%. Right now, they're at 3.6% margins, so that's almost a doubling of the margins. Okay. Uh, I believe they also have shares in some of their subsidiary companies. Uh, would that uh, add some more to their value? You know what? They're all in the same boat, right? All their businesses outside of the food business are the same kind of business. In fact, you got to you got to give the Adani Group credit. I mean, this is not the kind of business that most companies want to be in. It's a messy, long-term, capital-intensive business, and it's almost like the Adani Group. That's their focus. It's on those types of business. So you take port, you take power, you take energy. Every single company shares exactly the same characteristics: big investments, capital-intensive, low margins. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. And much of this, as you point out, has been built on debt. Uh, you point out that percentage of net debt is 91% uh, 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 of the capital and equity, percentage of equity is uh, just about 87 in the first uh, uh, 15 years, 2002 to 2015, actually. Uh, so That's a new uh, will that come raise. to bite? It's not, yeah. a, it's not a debt ratio. It's the amount of new capital they've raised has been almost entirely debt until the last year and a half, whether driven by you know, lenders' concerns or the fact that the market cap was so high. They used a little more equity in 2021 and 2022, but this is a company that's been reliant on debt for their growth. I mean, um, there's an old saying, what a tangled web we weave, and I won't finish the sentence, but I think control has driven the company to do things that you look at and say, why would you want to do that? And the answer is, I mean, this is a group that values control over almost every other objective in the company. Okay. Uh, since you say that you're not able to uh, support the price at, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the kind of current valuations, uh, what would your uh, advice be if you were asked uh, to the MSCI, to other indexes, they are in the Nifty as well, uh, do you think they should not have been included in the index in the first place? No, I think MSCI should do whatever the market. I mean, if the MSCI started valuing companies, we'd be in big trouble. Those guys okay. couldn't value a $20 bill in a brown paper bag if you put it in front of them. So I think they should take the market cap. It's not their fault that the market pushed it up. I would have an issue with the kind of unquestioning bullishness that's gone into pushing the price up. I mean, this is not a retail stock, so you can't blame retail investors. But there's something that's pushing the price up with no counter on the other side. And I think that's concerning when you have this. I mean, this isn't a tech company, a young company. We should see a ratcheting up of the price as much as you did in 2021 and 2022. So that is troubling to me that the market would let the price go up that much for a company that you look at and say, that company, you shouldn't see this much of a jump in the price over a short period. Okay. Uh, who do you think should have blown the whistle? You think it should have come from the regulators, from the capital market regulator? 
You know what? We, we get the regulators we deserve. I mean, much as Indian investors like to complain about regulators, they've been on a bull run but they really haven't wanted the regulators to save, to stop them from making money. You know, I find Indian investors start to talk about regulators only when they lose money. You know, regulation cuts both ways. So I think that, you know, we need to accept the fact that investing comes with risk, especially in equity, that losing money is just as much part of the game as making money. And we can't keep running to regulators every time we lose money. Say, save us from our own mistakes. So I think that in a sense, we're giving reg we're assigning to regulators powers that they cannot bring to the game. They cannot protect us from our own greed and our own mistakes. And I think sometimes people need to make their own mistakes to learn the lessons. In this case, they're going to be institutional investors who learn the lessons, green bondholders who will lead the but, but you know, those are the lessons you need to learn in marketplaces. Okay, and don't miss, to, uh, don't miss the entire full conversation today at 3.30 p.m. All right, well, it is definitely going to be an important day for the likes of Adani Transmission as well as Adani Ports tomorrow, considering that both of these companies will be releasing numbers. Adani Transmission today, it should probably be out in the second half of the trading session and Adani Ports tomorrow. So the street is going to watch for commentary from the management extremely closely. Do watch out for a couple of these stocks. We need to take a short break, but here's some exciting news. The most coveted leadership awards are back. CNBC TV 18 honors the visionaries behind outstanding businesses. Catch the most influential, credible, powerful Ibla jewelry on the 8th of Feb, right here on CNBC TV 18. Back at Ani Ports is well, the one which has moved to the high point of trade up almost 9% from the lows. And we do have Bajaj Finserv doing well as well. You're watching us here on Halftime Report. Let's get you a Network 18 exclusive. Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman re re reacted to the Adani crisis the first time uh, ever since uh, the budget she spoke to a media company, and that was Network 18. She spoke exclusively to Rahul Joshi. She said that the exposure of LIC and SBI to the Adani group remains within permissible limits, and the Indian regulators are stringent about governance, governance practices. Both the SBI and LIC have issued detailed statements. And I know the chairperson, uh, the CMD, has himself come out and explained how they are not overexposed, or whatever they said, yes. and also said, look, we are sitting over profits for the exposure that we have, which is well within the limit. That's what I understand they yes. have said, and I've, uh, uh, again, read it through the media. They have, they have very clearly said that their exposure is very well within the permis permitted limits and that they are even now with the valuation falling as well, they are still sitting over profit. India remains as before a absolutely well governed, stable government and also very well uh, you know, regulated financial market and as a result I think the uh, investor confidence which existed before shall continue even now. Our regulators are normally very, very stringent about certain governance practices. And therefore, they should one instance, is, one instance, however much talked about globally it may be, I would think is not going to be indicative of how well Indian financial markets are governed. Okay, that's the finance minister trying her best to allay concerns. She also said that she expected the decline in inflation to sustain added that it was not a momentary affair. Listen in. The way in which inflation has come down, both by RBI's action and by the government's action, and the government's action has been steady and at it for some time. Um, so I expect since the fall in the inflation, it doesn't seem to be just a momentary or a one month affair. It should sustain itself in the process of coming down. Any concern that you feel is there because of the twin deficit problems? Um, it's not as severe as before. Yes, yes when exports uh, come down, you're going to have the current account deficit. But it, it's also now suddenly going up as well as it was before, a couple of months ago. 
monthly fluctuations fluctuations i say yes fluctuations should not worry us Okay, so that's the finance minister. But let's move on to a CNBC TV 18 exclusive then. We learn from sources that SEBI has sought latest details on FBI clients' beneficial owners. The market regulator has asked FBI depository participants to provide the information by the 30th of September or risk losing their registration. Prashant joins in with the details on this story. Well, thanks very much uh, for that. Now, what we understand from industry sources is that SEBI has written an email to banks who deal with FBI registration as a process. This email was sent out last Friday evening with a focus basically on two issues. One is FBI registration and the second is beneficial ownership. Let me explain this a bit. So what is SEBI saying? SEBI is asking what are called designated depository participants to reach out to their foreign portfolio investors by the 31st of March 2023. Designated depository particip participants, DDPs, by the way, are units within banks who deal with the specific function of FBI registration. So SEBI is asking these uh, entities, DDPs, to in turn ask their FBIs who are registered with them to give them the updated beneficial owner details by the 30th of September this year. So there are very clear timelines uh, here from uh, the regulator. The SEBI communication says that if this is not done by the 30th of September, these FPIs would then become ineligible to continue their registration, which would then, according to the email, mean that they will have to sell their holdings, liquidate their holdings by the 31st of March 2024. I mean, I would like to add here that we've written to SEBI for an official comment and we are awaiting a response from them. Uh, now, to explain this issue with some examples, right? As I said, SEBI is focusing on two things. Number one is registration of F FPIs. If I can sort of use an example, uh, if there is, for example, a German bank, which is a unit based out of Hong Kong or Singapore or anywhere else, which invests as an FPI in Indian markets, SEBI is saying that the legal entity in this particular example, in this particular case, is, is the German bank, right? and not the unit operating out of Hong Kong or Singapore. Number two, the second issue the SEBI's uh, communication touches upon is identification of beneficial ownership. So if there is an FBI investing in India and there is no entity which can be clearly identified as the owner, the uh, threshold for to be considered an owner is having 10% or more invested in a fund, or control. If these two criteria are not met and a natural kind of uh, owner or controller cannot be identified, then the beneficial owner has to be identified as a very senior person and not a junior person or someone managing money, etc. It has to be uh, at a managing partner kind of level. All in all, clear communication uh, from, the, uh, uh, from SEBI that it wants to know the end beneficial owner of FPIs and there are clear timelines given by which it wants this information as well. As I said, we've written to SEBI and are awaiting a response from them. Back to you. Okay, all right, Prashant, thanks very much for that important story there. We need to take a short break, but we'll connect with Rakesh Khanna, who's the MD and CEO of Orient Electric, to discuss their Q3 performance on the other side. Stay tuned. Performance of the mid-cap index continues. We do have a bunch of stocks which are extending their gains. m and Financial up almost 10% as we speak. Jubilant Foodworks is the other one which has done extremely well as well. Moved to the high point of trade after the drubbing that it saw all of last week. In fact, uh, in, in uh, post its numbers, it fell about 10, 11% in just the next consecutive trading sessions, seeing some bit of recovery from the lows. So, uh, talking about numbers, we do have with us the management of Orient Electric. It posted a weakish set of third quarter numbers where we did see highest uh, ever volume growth coming in their fan segment as the company liquidated all its non-star rated fans ahead of uh, the new energy efficiency transmission. We do have with us uh, the CFO of the company joining in. Uh, thanks a lot to, for joining in uh, 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 Mr. Khanna, uh, who's, he's the MD and CEO of uh, Orient Electric. Uh, you know, the first question is with regards to your fans' business outlook in the fourth quarter. The first half of this quarter is marred by delayed winter, so that means that, you know, the offtake of fans would be low, and you've liquidated your entire inventory as well. What kind of sustainable volume growth can we expect in the fans' business in the second half of this quarter and all of FI24? Uh, good afternoon, Manglam. First of all, thank you so much. Uh, yes, there has been a very good quarter three for us, uh, both in terms of volume and in terms of gross revenue. Also, we expanded, although the EBITDA has been a little low because of some upfront investments, which are there for the long term. 
looking at the quarter four, well, January has been a little muted, but we are already seeing the new stock has started moving in the market. Uh, the old stock is uh, is going out of the out of the counters, and we are fairly hopeful that quarter four should be good. Your e-commerce business has done very well, especially in certain segments, whether it's water heaters, whether it's air coolers. Uh, can you tell us e-commerce? Uh, I mean, on a low base, it's risen almost four times year on year in Q3. How much does it contribute as an overall percentage now to your revenues? And what's the eventual plan over the next couple of years? How much do you plan to grow it by? Uh, E-commerce is now already uh, trending towards more than 10% in our total revenue. Hmm. And uh, we do expect that it should touch 20% plus in, in a year or so. Okay. And within e-commerce, uh, I mean, if you're expecting it to grow, what is the kind of, which are the products that see maximum traction there? How is it uh, operationally? I mean, if e-commerce rises, do you think it could benefit your operations, your blended margins purely because you know you don't, you won't have to, uh, you know, incur other fixed costs? Uh, yes and no, both. Uh, first of all, the the growth is essentially coming from fans and from coolers and water heaters appliances. Essentially, it is not from lighting as of now. Although we have now a good plan, how do we take lighting up in that space? Uh, but the large part is driven by the ECD segment. Uh, E-commerce definitely is one place which which affects the total brand, because most of the customers they they uh, they actually check the brand online before they go and make up their mind and buy offline. So therefore, in terms of brand presence, being present on e-commerce is strategically very important for us and uh, that's that's one of the reasons why we want to ensure that we are always visible okay. uh, this will also <clears throat> affect our offline sales okay uh, mr khanna you know i can see that uh, your air coolers business was up around 2x in the previous quarter but i'm more interested in knowing about uh, say air purifiers are you within that segment do you sell air purifiers uh, no, we were there with DeLonghi and we will continue selling DeLonghi air purifiers, but that's small uh, in numbers. Uh, we are not taking big bet on air purifier as a category or for that matter, even the room heaters, uh, we're not taking big bet on them. Why uh, not? Fact, because that seems to be a segment which a lot of, of your peers seem to be tapping into simply because of the environment and what is taking place across cities in the country. So there's an exponential rise actually in air purifier sales. Why are you not taking a big bet on it and other segments that you might think would be lucrative within the sales space? No, you are right. Uh, this is a growing category, but given our priorities and looking at the very high seasonality of these products, mm -hmm. we think that it's better to focus on some of the areas where we see far higher growth potential than these, these categories in absolute numbers. These, these categories, even if they have a high growth rate, are still significantly small and uh, we we definitely pegging our priorities on some larger bets. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Mr. Khanna, in the non-ECD part of your business, we have seen uh, you launching the wire portfolio in six states, seeing good traction. Just wanted to understand how uh, do you expect this to play out in terms of uh, sales going forward? What's your expansion plan? And the other one is facade lighting, where we have seen a fair amount of orders coming in from uh, governments and institutions to light up all, uh, you know, organizations, edifices, offices. How big do you see as an opportunity there for you? So in terms of wires, I think that completes the portfolio that we required because very, very important when an electrician starts into any house, the first thing that the electrician brings in is the wires, and therefore it was a very important part of the portfolio. Uh, we're becoming big in switches, switch gears, etc., uh, and therefore going forward, the entire electricals in the house. Uh, okay. In terms of facade, in terms of facade, yes, it's a it's a great opportunity, and I'm I'm very proud for what the team has delivered in a very short time creating that kind of a competency in-house and taking up such prestigious projects across the country. Uh, facade uh, is going to be growing. Consider India as a uh, quite an underlit country when compared to the developed okay. countries in the world. 
Okay, got and that. Uh, so, you know, area. sure, sure. Just one final question from my end. You know, you've been aspiring to reach double-digit margins for a long time now, but you've been unable to do that. Uh, why is that? And can we expect the company to touch, say, 10, 11 percent margins anytime in FY24 or 25? Yeah, sure. So if you really see uh, even our quarter three performance, uh, take out the one time expenses that we are putting in, which are uh, for the long term upfront costs, uh, we are fairly close to 10 percent EBITDA margin. Mm. Uh, our gross margins, for example, have actually expanded if you would have seen. Uh, so we very confident we will touch the double digit. It is just that as of now, there are some strategic upfront expenses that we're committing ourselves to which will catapult us to the next level of efficiency and growth. Uh, so, yes, that's our that's our ambition. We would definitely deliver double-digit margins soon. Okay, all right. Uh, so, we're going to leave it on that note. Thanks very much for joining in and speaking with us. So, that's Orient Electric. The stock is down around 2-odd percent for the markets. The Nifty down around 130-odd points. Mid-caps managing to hold up with a gain of around 7 tenths of a percent. Take a break, uh, but on the other side, a lot of stocks in focus today. So more on that once we're back. Actually, the newsmaker of the day is Vodafone Idea. It's up over 20% after the government cleared the conversion of Vodafone Idea's interest dues worth over 16,000 crores into equity. This will make the government now the largest shareholder in the debt-ridden telecom company. May change the game as well. You never know. Reema joins in to tell us more on that. Reema. Thanks so much for that. So as you pointed out, the government has given its go-ahead to convert AGR dues owed by Vodafone Idea to the government to the tune of 16,133 crore rupees into equity. The conversion will take place at a price of 10 rupees per share, which is the face value. Now, this is a big positive for Vodafone Idea uh, because this conversion has been pending for nearly a year. Now that the government is finally going to go ahead and convert, it shows the government's interest uh, and commitment to uh, making sure that Vodafone Idea's uh, future continues to remain. Outlook India has competition. There are three private players in the market. Also, as you said, the government will be the single largest shareholder in the company now with a 33% stake in the company. It's positive for Indus uh, Towers because uh, Vodafone Idea perhaps will now be able to repay its dues that it owes to vendors like Indus Stars. So that's the reason why Indus Stars is higher in trade. But on the flip side, just in the near term, it's negative for Bharti Airtel and Reliance Geo because at least as Bofa said, now there is a very low probability of the company going to NCLT. There is not going to be a duopoly market. This is going to be a three-player market so it's negative news so the kind of subscriber growth that they were seeing at the expense of Vodafone idea now will come to an end but what's the way forward uh, well um, right now at least it's not that money is getting infused into Vodafone idea it's just a cash flow relief so the company will need to see some fundraising fundraising either from the promoters or external investors so they can start their 5g journey back to you Okay, thanks a lot, Reema, for that. Well, let's do one thing. Let's take a short break. We'll get you more on the markets and stock-specific action on the other side. Stay with us. Next day, just want to point out uh, two stocks within the nifty space. Divi's Labs continues to reel under pressure. It's lost around 18-odd percent on a year-to-date basis. Remember, it was a steep fall post its numbers on Friday during market hours. The other one is Bharti Airtel. It's down around 1-odd percent. It's a tale of two cities because Vodafone is up around 20-odd percent. Uh, the government wants telecom to be a three-player market and Bharti Airtel does come out with its numbers tomorrow. So maybe there will be a lot of commentary to look forward to. Also, just watch out for Adani Ports. It is now the top gain on the Nifty. So it's seen buying at lower levels. It's a wrap on Halftime Reports. Stay tuned. Business Lunch up next.